Hello everyone! I want to extend a warm welcome to the 2021 Pacific Northwest Palliative Care Summer Series hosted by the Cambia Palliative Care Center of Excellence. I'm Teresa Brongart, Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer for UW Medicine Valley Medical Center and served as this year's conference co-chair along with Dr. Rashmi Sharma. Many of the talks to be delivered over the next eight weeks were originally scheduled for our canceled 2020 conference. The intent of this summer series is to revive our efforts and to bring together those on the forefront of serious illness to foster learning, inspiration, and hope, and continue to provoke conversations that matter. I am honored to be with you today to provide perspectives from my nursing experience in critical care. Prior to my role at Valley, I worked at Harborview Medical Center as a nurse and subsequently nurse leader for both the medical and neuroscience intensive care unit. Over the years there, I had the great privilege to experience how the integration of palliative and critical care benefits our patients, their families and loved ones, and improves the resilience and well-being of all clinicians working with people in crisis, not only physically, but in very emotional, and highly traumatic psychological crisis due to unexpected, unanticipated illness or injury. In my current position, I collaborate with clinical leaders throughout the continuum of care, from advanced care planning to end-of-life communication and decision-making, to help improve the patient and family experience, and am a champion of integrating palliative and medical or curative care wherever we meet the patient in their healthcare journey. I work in collaboration with our palliative and critical care teams on advancing the concepts of palliative care and implementing tools that help our clinicians address our patients' and families' palliative care needs. But today, I want to share why I'm so passionate about palliative care and what fuels this passion for me. In my previous leadership roles at Harborview Medical Center, I had the privilege of working with Dr. Randy Curtis and other clinicians on the agenda today. And I would like to take the next few minutes to share with you what I've learned throughout these experiences and address why developing palliative care skills is so important and why it's especially so important for nurses to have input into the multidisciplinary plan and some brief comments on how the pandemic highlighted the need for excellent palliative care and the challenges our teams experienced when families weren't able to be physically present with their loved ones. For my nursing colleagues, I can't stress enough how important it is for nurses to have an active role in palliative care and to build skills in this specialty. In March of 2017, the American Nurses Association and the Hospice and Palliative Care Nurses Association presented a call to action for nurses to lead and transform palliative care. The recommendations included the adoption of end-of-life nursing education consortium as the standard for primary palliative nursing education. It is the unique position we have with our patients that make this call to action an imperative in providing holistic, patient-centered care. I believe our nursing education programs must move to include this knowledge area in all standard curriculum. One of the primary reasons is that nurses spend the most time with the patient and their family. Because of our constant presence at the bedside, we are in the perfect position to gain a greater understanding from the patient and family perspective, just simply by spending time and building a trusting relationship. The nurse can gain information to inform the multidisciplinary team simply from what we hear, what we see and understand from being at the bedside. And we are really good listeners. And we often field the questions families are afraid or intimidated to ask doctors. Nurses may be the first person the patient or family opens up to about their questions, their needs or their goals and wishes, just because of the time we spend together. Nurses have a unique ability to extend their empathy coupled with their caregiving skills that allow them to build trust with the family and the clinical team. The better equipped we are in addressing their questions and bringing them forward to the multidisciplinary team, the more effective we can be in advocating for our patients. For these reasons, nurses have the unique ability to provide valuable contributions to the multidisciplinary team in helping to achieve the best communication and ultimately outcomes for our patients. 
but there are other reasons why developing palliative care skills is so very important. At the most basic human level, and that is for our own health and well-being. In a recent AACN webinar series, that's the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, the recognition of moral distress evidence suggests that of all threats to nurses' well-being, moral distress is the least understood but the most detrimental. Moral distress has been described as knowing the right thing to do but face constraints that make doing it nearly impossible. This conflict threatens our core values and moral integrity that can lead to nurses leaving the profession altogether. Nurses encounter many people experiencing life-limiting disease or illness for which they potentially have not had meaningful discussions regarding their goals of care, quality of life, or participated in shared decision-making with their family or surrogate decision-makers. Furthermore, most surrogate decision-makers are unaware of the wishes of their loved one, which makes it even more difficult to know what to do. We witness the suffering of people at the end of life, and at times this burden is felt by the fact that we are contributing to that suffering, and further may feel that we are taking part in futile care. Many deaths that occur in the hospital setting, especially in the ICU, involve decisions to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining measures. Again, nurses experience the burden of feeling they are contributing to suffering when these decisions are delayed for days or weeks on end, and this can result in feelings of moral distress. Family and physician communication around these decisions is still a major source of family and nurse dissatisfaction. Nurses witness inconsistent messages from attendings and other consulting specialists with families that make it more confusing for them, and often they are left trying to answer questions to account for these differences. The emotional toll this can have on nurses varies from psychological symptoms of anxiety and depression to feelings of helplessness and can also manifest in physiologic symptoms such as nausea, migraines, GI upset, and inability to sleep. This can also ultimately lead nurses to leaving the bedside altogether. I experienced this wide range of emotional trauma myself as a bedside nurse and later as a nurse manager. It was also a source of moral distress for me as a leader. I could see our nurses needed help in understanding and navigating these feelings but wasn't sure of the course of action to take and to help them. It wasn't until our team in the medical ICU started working with Dr. Curtis in the early 2000s on advancing the concept of palliative care into our multidisciplinary rounds did nurses start to fully understand how they could incorporate palliative care tools and concepts into their practice and how this could make a meaningful difference in their daily work. We also got to be involved in developing and testing order sets supporting the physiology of the withdrawal of life support. And back then, honestly, we weren't very good at it until we learned to understand that withdrawal of life support is a procedure that has a process and a method that can result in a peaceful death filled with dignity and compassion. Not to confuse palliative care with comfort care or end of life care, which happens all the time, but the palliative care research and resulting symptom management really improved and informed how withdrawal of life support was managed. This work became a source of great relief and a source of empowerment for nurses. It not only benefited the patients and families we were serving, but also the well-being and morale of the entire clinical team. Witnessing suffering and death is part of our calling but knowing that we are part of a team supporting each other and working together to provide the very best care, whether it is at end of life or developing goals of care, eases the burden of facing what we all may experience at some time in our life, and that is a serious illness or disease. As clinicians, one of our greatest gifts we can give is to assist people and their loved ones through their decision-making process when faced with a life-limiting illness, and ultimately to aid them through a death that honors their wishes and those of their family. This work, though, can take a great toll 
on all clinicians and increase their risk of burnout and decreased emotional well-being and contribute to a lack of resilience. As a nurse leader, my role is to help give nurses the tools to aid them in their work, take good care of their physical and emotional well-being by learning how to manage difficult conversations, by utilizing the concepts of palliative care, and that is what fuels my passion to this day. Because I witnessed firsthand how this work changed everything about the way nurses felt about how they could contribute differently in these daily conversations. It gave them the tools to discuss the needs of the patient and family. In fact, one of the first tools we started using on rounds was the Discuss tool developed by Dr. Darrell Owens, currently the director of the Palliative Care Service at UW Medical Center Northwest Campus. This tool provided our clinicians and anyone who wanted to use it the questions and words about how to bring up the benefit of palliative care for their patient. At that time, nurses did not formally present on rounds, so we had to be courageous to bring up what was then a relatively new topic. Our leadership team supported the nurses because not all attendings were comfortable with these conversations. That was to be expected. But slowly the culture started to change, and the changes I saw most were in our nurses' ability to manage difficult conversations, to bring forward important family issues and concerns, and feel confident they were doing the right thing for their patient, their loved ones, and very importantly for themselves. Those feelings of helplessness were no longer there, or were at least lessened. And for this, this was life-changing. And that culture continues to evolve today. As more research is done, new practices are put into place, and more clinicians improve their primary palliative care skills. In closing, I'd like to touch briefly on the challenges of facing moral distress during the COVID-19 crisis. The early stages of the pandemic created unprecedented challenges on the front lines of care across the continuum, including insufficient supplies of personal protective equipment, equipment shortages overall, compromised staffing and resources needed to care for patients, especially the critically ill, and balancing our own professional duty and responsibilities with our personal safety. Although we are still learning and understanding what this past year has meant to all of us, the emotional toll is something exponentially more traumatic than anything I've ever lived through in my 32 years of nursing. As a result, many healthcare providers are experiencing moral distress that has been prolonged now for over a year. None of us lived, have lived through a time where there existed so much uncertainty about what was to come, so much so that we could not allow family members to be with their loved ones. I cannot think of anything more horrifying, isolating, and just so unbelievably hard for our caregivers to live through, and I have never witnessed so many tears as we have this past year. Each member of the clinical team became the family of the patient. Even with the virtual methods and technology, nothing can replace the presence of human connection and interaction at the time of death. Our caregivers became that only source of connection and in many ways still are today due to the isolation practices required for the care of COVID-19 infections. Leaders in the critical care unit worked very hard to acknowledge these feelings at each shift huddle to allow space and time to talk about how everyone was doing, knowing that every one of us is facing loss, to include a moment of gratitude at the beginning of each shift and implement critical debriefings to acknowledge that we have not failed, we have done our best and we made a difference. Through this challenging time, we have improved our moral resilience. I know everyone attending this conference today is as passionate as I am about these topics or else you wouldn't be here. We all want to learn how we can make a difference, how we can improve our practice, and ultimately take the best care of our patients and ourselves. I hope that the concepts shared in this series will help you change and improve your practice and will help in healing the wounds we all carry as clinicians, 
working in this most amazing and fragile space. So now, here to kick off our summer series is Dr. J. Randall Curtis. Dr. Curtis is a pulmonary and critical care physician at Harborview Medical Center at the University of Washington. He also holds the A. Bruce Montgomery American Lung Association Endowed Chair in Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, and he is the founding director of the Cambia Palliative Care Center of Excellence at UW Medicine. He has an active research program with over 25 years of continuous funding focused on improving palliative care for patients with serious illness as well as for patients' families. Dr. Curtis is a champion for timely integration of innovative research and quality education into the healthcare system. I am so honored to have been involved in a small part of his work and also to call him a friend. His research has taught us so very much about how to improve family communication and given us the tools and data to provide the very best care for those facing serious illness to choose their path. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Curtis in his talk entitled, Promoting Serious Illness Communication at UW Medicine, Using Research and Education to Improve Healthcare. Thank you. Welcome to the Cambia Palliative Care um, Center of Excellence Summer Series. Uh, my name is Randall Curtis. I am the director of the Cambia Palliative Care Center of Excellence. Um, and I have the opportunity to present one of the lectures to you uh, on promoting serious illness communication at UW Medicine using research and education to improve health care. I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. I do like to acknowledge our funding sources for our center and our research, which includes our healthcare system, UW Medicine, the Cambia Health Foundation, as well as several of the institutes at the NIH and PCORI. I also have another disclosure of sorts, um, not really a disclosure as much as an explanation um, I have uh, bulbar onset ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, which affects my speech. Um, it also makes this topic of serious illness communication particularly relevant uh, for me, even more so than it used to be. I'd like to take a pause on that, uh, just acknowledge the emotion that comes with that, um, and then I'll restart. What I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, the role of our center in promoting serious illness communication uh, through research, education, and clinical care. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work we've done around communication during ICU family conferences, and then also talk about promoting goals of care discussions before the ICU, either in the clinic setting or in the acute care setting. Uh, and then I'll finish up talking a little bit about how to have and support a goals of care discussion. A few words about the center. The Cambia Palliative Care Center of Excellence was launched by UW Medicine in 2012, and it became the Cambia Palliative Care Center of Excellence in 2014 with a, a very generous and large uh, grant from the Cambia Health Foundation. Our mission is to improve palliative care uh, received by patients with serious illness and their families and provide support to clinicians providing that care. And we do that through developing innovative clinical programs, educational resources, and the evidence base to improve palliative care at UW Medicine regionally and nationally. From the beginning, we've had a dual focus at the center. We are focused on both improving primary palliative care, that is care provided by all clinicians caring for patients with serious illness, and specialty palliative care, care provided by palliative care specialists. 
This shows you the organization of the center and the palliative care programs at UW-Medicine. UW-Medicine has appointed Jim Fausto as a uh, medical director for palliative care uh, and Blair Mills as the palliative care administrator. Uh, and then uh, our center also includes both Blair and Jim, as well as directors around education, quality improvement, research and research education, pediatrics, as well as equity, diversity, and inclusion. The key components of the center are really the key components of an academic health system, clinical education, and research. But the, from the beginning, we've really tried to integrate these and not let them be in silos. And in fact, we view the sweet spot for the center is to focus on the overlap between these components. And this really allows us at the center to contribute to UW-Medicine being a learning healthcare system. Much of my work and the work of the center <clears throat> began by exploring the communication that occurs in the ICU, in the intensive care unit, for family members of patients who are critically ill and unable to participate in discussions about their goals of care and the care that they would want. We started by audio taping 51 family conferences in four hospitals around the Seattle area. And this included over 200 family members and over 200 clinicians who participated in these family conferences. On average, <clears throat> these family conferences were about 32 minutes long. Um, and if you look at what proportion of the time family members spoke versus clinicians speaking, we found that family members spoke less than 30% of the time and more than 70% of the time was clinicians speaking. And we were interested in whether either of these factors, the duration of the proportion of family speech, was associated with the family's ratings of these conferences. So we asked family members, to rate how well did the physician leading the conference do in communicating. This was a zero to 10 scale. And we found a positive correlation with the proportion of family speech. That is, the more the family spoke, the higher they rated the communication of the physician. There was no association with the duration of the family conference. We asked the families, how well did the conference meet your needs? Same finding. The more we let families speak, the higher they rate the conference meeting their needs. No association with how long the conference was. So this is observational data, but it suggests one of the key ways we can improve communication in family conferences and, I would argue, in a lot of settings around serious illness communication is to listen more and speak less. We looked at whether specific things clinicians said were associated with increased family ratings or family satisfaction, and there were three. Assuring the family the patient would not be abandoned prior to death, assuring the family the patient would be kept comfortable and not suffer prior to death, and providing support for the family around whatever decision was made, whether that was a decision to withdraw life support or continue life support, explicitly providing support for the family around that decision. And it surprised me how often clinicians actually didn't do that. They listened to the family and said, okay, whatever you want, that's what we'll do, without providing that explicit support. We were interested in looking at missed opportunities during these family conferences. <clears throat> and in going through those, we, fell, we found that they fell into one of three categories. Missing the opportunity to listen and respond, answering questions, and clarifying and following up on family statements. Sometimes the family would ask a question, um, and there would be no answer provided. 
More commonly, the family would ask a question and the clinicians would answer a different question, not really listening to what the family was asking for. Another missed opportunity was the opportunity to acknowledge and address emotions that come up during the family conference. And then finally, we, the third one we called missing the opportunity to address basic tenets of palliative care, exploring patients' preferences, explaining the principle of surrogate decision making. That is the role of the family <coughs> is not to say what they want, but what they think the patient would want in these circumstances if they were able to fully participate. Uh, and then finally, affirming non-abandonment. We also looked at the types of empathic statements made during these conferences. Uh, almost a third a clinician made an empathic statement about the difficulty of having a critically ill loved one. Um, a little over 40% a clinician made an empathic statement about the difficulty of being placed in the situation of surrogate decision making. And then a little over a quarter of the time, a clinician made an empathic statement about facing the impending loss of a loved one. What we found is the more empathic statements were made in a conference, the higher the family's ratings. So, so I think uh, understanding the ways that we can support these, these families through empathic statements uh, is very important. We took all this information and developed a mnemonic <coughs> that we called VALUE, a five-step approach to improving communication with families in the ICU. The V is for explicitly valuing the things that family says. A for acknowledging emotions. L for listening to the family. U for understand the patient as a person. So asking questions that allow us to understand what's really important to this patient. And then E for eliciting family questions. And then we had an opportunity to work in collaboration with a group in France led by Eli Azoulay to use this value strategy in a randomized trial that was conducted in France and published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007. In this trial, uh, we identified 126 patients that the attending physician in the ICU believed would die within a few days. And they were randomized to either usual care or the intervention, which was to ask the team to have a proactive interdisciplinary family conference, including ph physicians and nurses, uh, and using this value strategy. Uh, they also, uh, the intervention also included giving a bereavement pamphlet to the family after the family conference. And the outcomes were to look at family members' symptoms of anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder three months after the patient died in the ICU. And I think the results of this study were important for two reasons. One, the level of these symptoms were very high. And second, this relatively simple intervention focused on improving our communication with family was associated with really dramatic reductions in the levels of these symptoms. One of the pieces that I think is really important to emphasize is that we often think of the physician leading the conference, but in fact, there are really important roles for nurses, social workers, and other members of the interprofessional team in this communication and in family conferences. Um, oftentimes, the nurses and social workers help prompt us to have a family conference, may organize the conference. We, gen we almost always now have a pre-huddle of the team before the family conference to talk about our goals and our approach. And it's so important to have nurses and social workers there for that, where they can give us information they've heard from the family uh, that can really help us in doing a good job in this communication. The interprofessional team members can remind family members about questions or concerns that they had raised previously, often at the bedside. They can identify opportunities for supporting family members, 
particularly uh, making these empathic statements, for example, um, that can be very helpful. And also express availability for answering questions after the meeting where they may be, in some ICUs, more available uh, than the physicians. I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about promoting goals of care discussions before the ICU uh, in both the clinic and the acute care setting. <clears throat> And I'm going to use as an example some of the work that we've done with something we call a jumpstart guide. Um, and I think this is an example of how we can use research and education to promote a learning health system around palliative care and serious illness communication. We're interested in testing whether our communication priming intervention can help improve goals of care discussions. And we've thought about this in a couple of ways. First, a bi-directional approach in which we prompt and guide both patients or family members as well as the clinician. And then secondly, a clinician-only approach. And we've done this in both the outpatient setting as well as the acute care setting. This is an example of one of our Jumpstart guides it provides some information about this patient, their current code status, uh, whether they have advanced directives or a pulse form, and if so, when those were completed and how to find them, and then provides some suggestions for the clinicians around how to have a goals of care discussion. Uh, if we're also giving one to patients or families, there's similarly some suggestions for them about what to think about before a conversation like this and what questions to ask their clinicians. We also provide a place for clinicians or patients and families to give us feedback about the Jumpstart Guide. A word about terminology and how I'm using these words, advanced care planning and goals of care discussions, because I think this is important. <clears throat> I think of advanced care planning as the broader category of really all discussions about values, goals, and preferences for future care. And that can include conversations with healthy individuals, those with chronic illness, as well as those who are imminently dying. Goals of care discussions is an important part of advanced care planning really focusing more on discussions about current goals and how they should inform current and immediate future care. Uh, and this is more relevant for those with chronic life-limiting illness, uh, which I would consider early goals of care discussions, or those who are imminently dying, late goals of care discussions. And our Jumpstart Guide is really intended to promote these early goals of care discussions. Why focus on goals of care discussions? There is good data that these discussions, when done well, are associated with increased quality of care and quality of life for patients, reduced psychological distress for patients and their families, and reduced intensity of care and more goal-concordant care at the end of life. Unfortunately, these conversations frequently don't occur for patients with chronic serious illness or occur too late, like in the ICU, when patients can no longer participate. We were just in looking at how, whether these are happening often enough and how this is working at UW Medicine. We did a retrospective cohort specifically looking at pulse orders um, or physician orders for life sustaining treatment. Uh, this, we looked at over 1,800 decedents uh, who died between 2010 and 2017 and who were admitted to a UW Medicine Hospital in the last six months of life. We found that of these decedents who had a pulse form, 22% on that pulse form filled it out for comfort measures only, 42% filled it out for a limited intervention. And these kinds of treatment limiting pulse were associated with lower intensity of care at the end of life, suggesting these order forms, in fact, do work to limit 
life-sustaining treatments at the end of life for those with chronic illness. But we found that 38% of patients with a treatment-limiting pulse received pulse discordant care. Uh, and that's important for us to understand and think about how we can improve that. Risk factors for pulse discordant care included diseases other than cancer or dementia, which tend to have a more difficult to predict trajectory and prognostication is harder. Um, and the presence of trauma was also associated with more pulse discordant care uh, since that often happens in an unexpected way, surprising family members and clinicians. So we wanted to see if the Jumpstart Guide could help us improve goals of care discussions. Uh, our basic question in this study was whether the bi-directional, patient-specific communication priming intervention could improve goals of care discussions in the outpatient setting. Bi-directional, because it went to both the patient, a, a form uh, for the patient, and there was a different one for the clinician. And it was patient-specific because we used surveys with patients to identify specific information about what they wanted to talk about and what was important to them to help prime and guide these discussions. This was a cluster randomized trial where we randomized both primary care and specialty clinicians, physicians, and advanced practice providers in two uh, multi-hospital healthcare systems. And we enrolled 132 clinicians uh, and 500, 537 patients with a chronic illness and a median survival of about two years. So the intervention, again, was a jumpstart guide delivered to both the clinician and the patient within a day or two before a target routine clinic visit. And the control arm, I consider usual care plus, in that they did fill out the same surveys, which may have prompted them to think, both the clinicians and the patients, about having these discussions. Our primary outcome was whether the patient reported that a goals of care discussion occurred during that clinic visit, and we did see a significant increase with the intervention from 31% in the control group up to 74% in the intervention group. We also saw an increase in the EHR documentation of goals of care discussions from 17% to 62%. We also asked patients to rate the quality of the communication by that clinician at that visit <clears throat> using a four-item survey called the quality of communication. Uh, and that increased significantly with the intervention from 2.1 on a 0 to 10 scale to 4.6. And that was a moderate effect size uh, for this measure. And this shows you the four items that we asked patients about. How well did this clinician do at talking about your feelings about getting sicker, and the treatments you'd want at the end of life, what's important to you in your life, and those three individual items all improved, as well as the details of getting sicker, um, which increased but not significantly. So that was the work we did in the outpatient setting. We were then interested in seeing whether this might work in the inpatient setting. And so we did a pilot trial <clears throat> with 150 hospitalized patients who were over 55 years of age, had a chronic life family illness, and did not have a palliative care consult service involved at the time the patients were enrolled. We did this at two of the UW Medicine hospitals um, and this intervention, again, was based on patient surveys delivered by email and in-person to clinicians and in-person to patients. And this was compared to usual care, again, plus the surveys. We did see an increase in the EHR documentation of goals of care discussions with this intervention. They were low, 8% up to 21%. 
um, patient and family report in this study was harder. I think it's harder for them to understand and be able to fill out these surveys when the patient is acutely ill in the hospital. So we didn't see an increase there. But I think in conclusion, this Jumpstart Guide so far does increase the occurrence and quality of goals of care discussions in the outpatient setting by both patient report <coughs> as well as EHR documentation. Um, but this version has been challenging to implement across the system because of the need for these surveys. And we're interested in exploring ways to do that without surveys. Uh, we also saw increased documentation of goals of care discussions for inpatients um, in our, our pilot trial. And we found prevalence of goals of care discussions is fairly low for this patient population and represents an opportunity for improvement. Based on the pilot trial, we were able to get a five-year grant from the NIH, uh, specifically the National Institute of Aging, to conduct two complementary randomized trials of the inpatient jumpstart. <clears throat> the first trial, trial one, is a large pragmatic trial just using a clinician-facing jumpstart. Uh, and we wanted to do that because that is so much easier to implement broadly across the system without having to collect survey data from patients. So we're identifying older, seriously ill patients who are hospitalized at UW Medicine, randomizing them to usual care or a clinician-facing jumpstart, and then looking at outcomes of documentation of goals of care discussions as well as care received. We also are doing a second trial as part of the study to look to see whether that bi-directional approach is important, part of this. And so here we're going to randomize patients to either the clinician facing jumpstart alone, like trial one, or the bi-directional jumpstart. And this is the comparative effectiveness trial, where we'll look at patient surveys as well as the uh, outcome from the electronic health record. Trial one has recently been com completed and we actually exceeded our target enrollment uh, with over 2,500 patients enrolled, reflecting how easy this is to do with just a clinician facing approach. I don't yet have results to tell you the outcomes of that. We're also very interested specifically in a subgroup of patients with dementia and we have 329 patients with dementia enrolled in that trial. So more to come on the results of that, but these are examples of the work that we're doing to try to promote these conversations uh, for patients in both the outpatient community setting as well as in the hospital. So then I want to finish by talking a little bit about uh, how to have and support these goals of care discussions and some of the work we're doing specifically around uh, the educational component of this. And Susan Merrill pictured here is leading this educational arm of the center uh, and uh, has been in, instrumental in helping us put together uh, the educational work that we're doing. One piece is the Pacific Northwest Palliative Care Conference, which we have annually. annually. Uh, which, uh, as you know, this year we couldn't meet in person, so we're having this uh, summer seminar, but we generally have this conference in person uh, every year in April. There's also the Palliative Care Training Center, the PCTC at UW, uh, working closely with the center. Uh, and this is a nine-month program, including some uh, online learning and some in-person learning, um, really promoting palliative care education. And if you're interested in this, I highly recommend you look into this program. We are also heavily involved in supporting clinical electives around palliative care and medicine, surgery, and psychiatry clerkships at the UW School of Medicine, and communication training for residents and fellows in medicine, surgery, neurology and pediatrics. And then we have 
brief educational programs for UW medicine clinicians across the system uh, and across multiple professions. And Susan Merrill has been leading a number of brief training sessions that are specifically associated with our Jumpstart or PICSI trials <clears throat> and is framing this around two frameworks, a 10 minute and a 20 to 30 minute goals of care discussion. And we're using these to supplement the Jumpstart and to, to ensure that clinicians understand how to have these discussions when they get a jump start. We're deliberately repeating these at multiple venues, uh, and, and Susan and others are doing these in 5, 15, 30, and 50 minute talks. <clears throat> and Susan's also developed an infographic to reinforce these talks that I'll show you a little later. So the first piece, the five to 10 minute piece is to plant a seed. And the second 20 to 30 minute piece is really to dig a little bit deeper. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about these goals of care discussion, the who, why, when, and where. First, who, I think there's a really key role here for the interprofessional team. Goals of care discussions should generally involve physicians and advanced practice providers at some point to ensure that they influence the plan of care. But the entire interprofessional team, including nurses, social workers, chaplains, and others, can participate to help patients' families think about and articulate their values and goals and to support these discussions and answer their questions. And I would argue that many of the same skills for having and supporting these discussions are common across disciplines. So why do we want to do this? Um, I think it's particularly helpful to identify some big groups and to figure out whether this patient may fall into one of these big groups. About 5 to 15% of older adults are what we call vitalists, that is any life is worth living. Um, and that's important to understand about patients and families. Um, for that patient who's a vitalist, goal concordant care may include intensive and life sustaining treatments at the end of life. About 15 to 25% of older patients with serious illness want very little life sustaining treatments under any circumstances, maybe based on their current quality of life being below a level they find acceptable, maybe based on their views about these treatments, but it's really important that we understand who those people are as well. And then the majority of people are in the middle or undecided. So they might want some life-sustaining treatments, but it really depends on the circumstances the potential outcomes, and what they would have to go through. In terms of when to have these discussions, brief, frequent conversations can be important for any patient with serious illness, but particularly around a new or worsening diagnosis, a frail older adult, changes or deterioration in functional status, a prolonged hospitalization, and a patient who appears to be suffering. How do you do this? Um, in five to 10 minutes, you can plant a seed. Uh, you can uh, get things started by saying, could we talk a few minutes about what is really important to you so that we make sure you are getting the best care for you? I think we talk about these um, as goals of care discussions, but it's important we don't use that term with patients they don't understand what we mean by that. We can use it, but we have to explain what we mean by it. So the 10 minute or brief framework, assessing their understanding of the illness, and then maybe choose one or maybe two topics to explore. What are you hoping for in the future? What are you worried about? What makes life worth living for you? And if you were to get sicker, what would be most important to you? And it's really important after asking a question like these 
to pause and to listen, to allow silence if the patient needs a moment to think or gather their thoughts. Um, asking these questions and not listening to the answer is worse than not asking them, in my opinion. Many people can have an emotional response to being asked some of these questions or having a serious illness conversation. Uh, and emotion really can shut down cognition. Uh, and so it's important to respond to emotion to help people feel cared for um, so that they can then go on and retain information and have a discussion. In terms of responding to emotion, we like to use this nurse mnemonic. It can be very helpful to name the emotion. It seems like you're very upset, or it seems like this makes you very sad. To make sure that we understand and to show that we see the emotion. To make a statement of respect, uh, to praise the patient or family member uh, for the intention behind the emotion. It's obvious you care very deeply for your loved one. To offer support, to offer to be with them through this process, and to explore and to really listen to their story. It's also important that we align with the patient's values. It sounds like you're hoping for better control of your shortness of breath and spend more time with your family. Am I getting that right? To really check in with them and make sure they know we want the same thing that they want. We want to come up with a way to provide care that meets their goals and values. And then it's always important to document these discussions. Um, even if no decision is made, uh, documentation helps other clinicians understand what was discussed it can help prevent over-discussing, asking people the same thing over and over again when nothing has changed. Um, and it helps us build on prior conversations so that each discussion can add and go deeper. This is the infographic that Susan has prepared, uh, talking about these two uh, approaches, this framework with planting the seed uh, in five to 10 minutes, or digging deeper in 15 to 30 minutes. So in conclusion, uh, communication about goals of care can improve patient and family outcomes, and we can improve these with targeted interventions, and we're working to implement those across our system. This also represents an opportunity to integrate research education and clinical care, and really promote a learning healthcare system around serious illness communication. Uh, and I think it's a, an important opportunity to incorporate the entire interprofessional team and ensure that the team is coordinated and communicating as well, so that conversations with one member of the team reach the others. I think we're making progress uh, but there's still work to be done, and we have our work cut out for us to get this to the place that it needs to be to ensure that we are providing patients with the care that they want, fully informed and supported by their clinicians. And with that, I will stop, and thank you very much for your attention.